is exactly the opposite of a consensual theater which stands for the image of an ideal sovereignty. So the theater of history is actually also theater of war. And that has been the language of both military diplomacy and political diplomacy over the years up to now, where even the present war that is going on between Ukraine and Russia is often spoken of as part of the theater of war. Jean Baudin is a figure divided between these two uh, meanings of both theater and sovereignty. Theater understood as, on the one hand, a space of absolute order hierarchy and an object of total consensus. In that sense, an image of ideal sovereignty. And at the same time, theater understood as a kind of historical site of war and something which is like a struggle over sovereignty, which ends up in victory and legitimacy on one side and loss and lack of legitimacy on the other. Now, in the actual theater practice of this very era, uh, let's take the example of Shakespeare. Say the play, uh, Richard III, among his history plays, we find this enacted with uh, the most splendid vividity, where Richard III represents something like an effort both to produce a kind of sovereignty through force, which is to both win wars and seduce uh, different kinds of you know, um, stakeholders of sovereignty, so as to usurp sovereignty, but also to fight the battle of legitimacy, such that at some point you'd be recognized as a, as a legitimate sovereign. This fight of legitimacy and the actual war that he is fighting against different stakeholders, eventually he loses so that he's finally exposed as a kind of um, notorious emblematic figure of evil in the historical theater of a kind of fractious, conflictual sovereignties. So on the one side, we see the perfect form of theater as an ideal sovereignty. And on the other side, we see something like the theater of history, which is divisive and fractious, but both have a common feature in both cases, and that is my first proposition, in both cases, something like an atmosphere, something like an environment is missing. In the first case of the ideal sovereignty of nature in Baba's uh, book, all of nature is like an encyclopedia in which nothing like free nature or pure nature or fuzzy nature can exist, but all natural objects must already be symbolized as ideal meanings, as part of a created entity which God creates, of course. So in that sense, there is theater possesses no atmosphere in, this, in, the, in the sense that atmosphere is something fuzzy. And also atmosphere is something which does not really depend or is determined by something like the human subject, the anthropological center. The atmosphere is a kind of uh, fuzzy surrounding air. Theater does not, like I said, does not uh, seem to, that air does not seem to enter the theater in this image of the theater as an ideal space of consensus. On the other hand, even though the theater of history is a space of uh, war over both victory, uh, who is the victorious sovereign, but also is the legitimate sovereign, the center remains anthropological. All heroes and villains of this historical theater are human. Anthrop it's an anthrop anthropological theater. Even here, even though battles are fought on, you know, battlefields and mountains and on the seas and so on, all of them gain their signification in this theater only through their meaning as human projects. In that sense, the, 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 the fundamental the fundamental entities in this theater remain, or, the, or, or those who occupy the space of this theater, remain absolutely defined and determined. As for instance, the hero who wins the battle and becomes a legitimate sovereign and the villain who loses the battle, but on both sides, 
the war that is being fought and the victory and the loss that is being experienced is centered around determined, defined, well marked out human bodies. The body of the hero and the body of the villain. So even here, actually in the theater of history, there is nothing really like an atmosphere. There is nothing like the air of nature which enters the meaning of history. History is completely determined at the level of something like human actors and human victims, where both the gesture of theater moves from the human actor to another part of the human space uh, who is the one acted upon. And then there is a kind of, there is a kind of uh, reversibility of the gesture, which creates a dramatic intensity. And also the, the same reversibility you find in discourse where the two sides fight over the legitimacy of ideas, which can be political, which can be theological, but eventually the fight of discourse and the fight of bodies takes place on the same level, which is entirely anthropocentric. So even though the, his, the, the, the historical theater is uh, apparently non-consensual and where sovereignty is still relatively undecided who is eventually going to become the sovereign. But that is not in any case uh, determined by any sense of anything outside human history. Something like an idea of an atmosphere or an environment. And the third uh, point from this uh, 16th century scenario, the, 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 third, uh, um, the third snapshot from this 16th century scenario concerns uh, the, 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 uh, the, 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 the uh, evolution of a certain method of negotiation between in the actual space of politics uh, between the different warring European states at that time, who all claimed a certain monopoly over uh, not just territorial sovereignty, but a certain kind of theological Christian sovereignty. And each of them was fighting a holy war against the other. And this became uh, so bloody and so unsustainable that in the 16th century, the Treaty of Westphalia created a new meaning uh, or a new signification for the historical theater of war, uh, which uh, wanted to prevent war, or at least this, this, this kind of a endless holy war, which uh, each side was wanting to fight to the bloody end. Uh, to prevent that sort, of a, that sort of a catastrophe, the Treaty of Westphalia uh, produced a space which was a paradoxical space of limited sovereignties where each sovereign enjoyed that limited legitimacy over one's own territory within Europe, which was actually a contradictory idea because the very meaning of sovereignty is that it must be an absolute single sovereign over which there is complete consensus, which interestingly in Baudin, the theater of nature retained. But in theater of history, we actually see develop a certain kind of space of negotiation between limited sovereignties. So we have three snapshots or three parts to this first scenario. The absolute theater, which nature seems to uh, emblematize, but a nature without atmosphere. In that sense, we can call it nature without nature. The second, which is a historical theater, which actually gets depicted very well in theater, in actual theater practice, particularly in Shakespeare. Where there is war, there is fractiousness, but even there, the horizon remains something consensual where eventually one side will gain legitimacy and the other will lose it in a kind of zero sum game. But the third snapshot, which is actually the real historical picture from um, 16th century Europe shows that uh, this horizon uh, in actual practice can only be a horizon, it can never end enter uh, the, 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 the body or the being of an absolute sovereign. And no one can win that kind of an absolute consensual right to sovereignty. 
the sovereignty will always be divided and negotiated. But the primary structural features still remains common between all three, uh, all of these three, uh, these three frames. And that uh, common structural feature is, like I said, the presence of well-defined anthropologically constituted subjects with very clearly marked out bodies, which both become targets of the gesture of war and also generate or radiate the splendor of successful sovereignty. So either they die on stage or they win the battle and, win the, and wear the crown such that they become splendid bodies, but they are human bodies. And this is also the paradigm which determines the mode of war because all wars in a obvious tautological sense seem to be fought in history between subjects which are historical human subjects. Now cut to second scenario uh, over, uh, and which is also a, a kind of leap over centuries, across centuries. This scenario with its uh, internal distinct frames and its common structural feature actually decisively uh, changes uh, with the arrival of early 20th century. And uh, here I uh, immediately go to my main reference and I uh, cite to you an extraordinary philosophical contribution by the contemporary German philosopher Peter, Peter Sloterdijk. Peter Sloterdijk in his text, in his book, Terror from the Air, relates to us an incident from 1915, so cut from 1590 to 1915, uh, April 22nd, when nearly for the first time during the First World War, we see the German troops on the one side, on the borders uh, of France, I think, Ypres, uh, Across the border stand the French Canadian troops, and the German the German uh, side. It explodes around 150 tons of chlorine gas in the air, and at 6 p.m. in the evening, and that gas blows in the direction which uh, uh, to uh, the, in the direction that the French Canadian troops uh, are stationed and uh, around six meters, uh, six kilometers, sorry, six kilometers uh, are now filled with this particular gas billowing in the sky. And what we suddenly see in this, and there are aerial photographs available of what was going on at that time, is a scene, a literal scenario, where we don't have simply the act of say a bullet fought or a sword, um, a, a, a sword cutting another's body. But what we have is a scene of a kind of berserk population of here French Canadian soldiers who are seen in positions of extreme distress. And uh, later uh, the German, uh, sorry, the French Canadian troops, uh, their general, Mordoc, in his memoirs speaks of, he got this news because he was slightly in the interior of, uh, across the border. So when he got this news and he tried to come towards where the smoke was filling the air, he saw, and he himself experienced in his own body, uh, soldiers who were having extreme respiratory, respiratory um, difficulties. And some of them were screaming and some of them were collapsing on the ground. So it was a scenario which was not a clean scenario of a body which has been done to death by the warring weapon of the enemy. Rather, it was a scenario of an atmosphere which has gone berserk. It was not a scenario which is a zero-sum scenario of one winning, one losing, one living and another dying. It was a scenario of progressive degeneration of bodies. 
where the rigidity and the determinability of the body was now modified to a scenario of something like gasification or fluidity. It is interesting that at a certain point, Peter Slotterdick says that this scene, if, seen, is, if witnessed not in terms of its actual reality, which is a horrific reality, but if sort of imagined as simply a scene from a text, let's say, would be considered a scene of pataphysics. He uses this word pataphysics. He does not explain it, but it uh, really begs the question, what is pataphysics? Now, pataphysics is a term that was invented by a young avant-garde French playwright who died at the age of something, uh, 35 or so, called Alfred Jarry. And Alfred Jarry, who wrote three plays, one of which is very famous, I mean, the, all three form a trilogy. The first one is the most famous one called Yubu Rua, Yubu the King, also wrote a short text, uh, which is, he called it a text of pataphysics, where he defined pataphysics to be the laws of the universe except of this one. In other words, laws of the exception to the lawful world. So pataphysics is to is a kind of science, is a kind of physics of bodies where bodies are going through something unnatural within the very space of nature. So in a way, when Peter started to says that the scene from Yepres seems to be a pataphysics, a scene from pataphysics, and he's saying that no one had seen a scene of war like that till then. It is within nature. But what is being targeted now is not really body. What is being targeted is the very space of nature. In, in a sense, it is through this warring strategy, which is to burst around 150 tons of chlorine gas, that something like for the first time, atmosphere is invented in human history. It is something as extraordinary as that. That it is when we experience ourselves not only as discrete individual bodies, but as part of an atmosphere in which there are no bodies because gas is not a body really, or it is a fluid body, which is imperceptible. It, it has crossed the threshold of phenomenalization, philosophically speaking. It is not really accessible to us as a phenomenon. And yet it is affecting us. In that sense, the space of theater or the theatrical schema of space and bodies has now been made perverse. And this is the moment, according to Slutterdick, of the invention of atmosphere. But Slutterdick's book is remarkable for another reason. It is not just a documentation of something that happens in a specific way, in a striking way. But he shows us that in the space of around 30 years between the end of First World War and the Second World War, the end of Second World War, 1944, what we find is an immense amount of scientific physiochemical research, uh, which is really a research oriented to two things. One is how to use gas warfare effectively. But on the other hand, it is also uh, a research which is intensely concerned with how to make yourself immune from gas warfare. So it is very interesting. The very time when one is doing intense research how to make gas warfare lethal, one is also doing intense research, which is perfectly logical, how to protect oneself from gas warfare. So this is also the time when new, uh, this is something in the COVID period, we are inheritors of this research when the new research and making masks takes place on a mass scale. New companies come into the picture who now make gas masks. Even in the first scenario, the second scenario really, but the part of the second scenario on the Ypres border, the German soldiers have already tried to protect themselves using cloth masks, wet masks over their noses. Because you see, one, another very interesting thing with gas warfare is that the line between the enemy's body and the, the hero's body has become fuzzy because when the hero explodes gas, then the hero is also, or 
well, not the hero really, but the, but the, but the, but the attacker, uh, the protagonist, explodes gas. And the protagonist, the protagonist is himself subject to the same atmospheric pollution that he perpetrates. So the protagonist has to protect himself from his own method of attack. That is the strategy of atmospheric war. And that is also the strategy which leads to a certain destabilization or decentering of the anthropocentric meaning of war. And what was metaphorically, uh, we inherited as what we call the theater of war. Now, between 1915 and 1940s, an immense amount of research happens uh, which is like I said, on both sides, methods of gassing, which of course culminate in the monstrosity of the gassing of the, uh, of the millions of Jews uh, during the Second World War uh, by uh, Hitler's SS. But on the other hand, uh, there's also an immense amount of research going on in the US on how to use gas paradoxically, as a relatively humane method of carrying out executions. So in the state of Nevada, this method of gassing, uh, you know, those who are sentenced to death is, uh, is carried out, is, 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 is tried out. And it is considered to be partly successful to the point that it also becomes a space of a spectacle so that the population, the US population in that area is invited to see across a glass door, the scene, the scenario of these executions. Now, you can see the, uh, the real modality of the scenario. The real modality of the scenario is this, that even the ones who are watching it as a spectacle are liable to be infected or be polluted or be endangered by the, by the gas if it somehow leaks through the gas chamber. So that's why this was an extremely um, uh, rigorous uh, um, uh, project of dividing the zones between those who were looking at the scene of the executions as a spectacle and the executions themselves. In other words, what we see as strategic points is out to us, what we see is that it is exactly when atmosphere is invented, which necessarily is fuzzy, where the division between determinate bodies and parties becomes more and more uncertain, that a new kind of research is instituted by human science, or not human science, by humans who you know do scientific research. In this case, um, you know, mostly physics and chemistry. But but what what they do is really also something which could be called, and Slaughter Day points this out, which would be called exercises in designing atmosphere. So now atmosphere must be designed so strictly that zones of those who are safe and those who are endangered must be totally differentiated or made distinct, where one absolutely does not touch the other. Because constitutively, naturally, atmosphere is fuzzy and not a discrete entity. It is a kind of continuous, what the great French philosopher uh, Gilles Dallas will call a continuous modelization, or even using a musical metaphor, modulation. All environments are continuously modelized and modulated. Exactly when you experience that through your own intervention in a new form of war, which is gas warfare, you also need to put a certain hold to that continuous modulation. And hence, you need to design atmosphere. So peculiarly, exactly when the anthropological theater, the anthropocentric theater of human war is getting destabilized and is being rendered gaseous, there is a rehumanization of this very you know, fuzziness or this very, this very uncertainty through a new human intervention, which started it calls the intervention of design. In that sense, the return of a kind of new idea of theater. But here, what we find, and that is my main point, over the 30 years of research that we see happening till the end of the Second World War, on the German side, and at least on the American side, is that though there is a 
particular, I mean, I don't have the time to go into it, but there's a particular type of research that's also going on in Stalin's Russia uh, with regard to this very, uh, this very method of war. Uh, but uh, that part, if you just take Germany and US as, as, the, as, as the two poles, and what we find in US is that this method of gassing as a method of legitimate execution is considered to be something which is more justified than the earlier methods of execution as part of a kind of pragmatism. So this is what Sotodic points out, that a kind of ideology of pragmatism, pragmatist philosophy, actually determines or declares that gassing is a more humane way of uh, you know, killing a, a, a criminal who has been sentenced to death. And uh, uh, in this context, uh, very interestingly, Slaughterdick cites the great um, writer Elias Kanethi, who at a certain place says that in the modern age, that is the age we're talking about, early 20th century, the beginnings of the modern age, one would shudder to attend a public execution in the way that the medieval uh, population would literally enthuse over a public execution, but one wouldn't shudder to unleash a mass war. Insofar as a mass war remains zoned, designed, and leads to both kinds of research. Research in methods of effective destruction, but peculiarly a method of rehumanizing destruction and re-legitimizing destruction. So one of the kind of uh, interesting but also perilous uh, philosophical um, implications of Slaughter Dick's work is that between Germany, which of course uh, went to the extreme of gassing methods uh, such that even mobile gas chambers were created where some Jews were killed on mobile trucks, not just in the, uh, in the, in the, in the notorious famous uh, you know, concentration camps in Auschwitz and other places. But the Germans also now use mobile gas chambers and, 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 and exterminated a part of the population. On the, U, on the American side, this very thing was actually uh, part of a far more streamlined design project where zones were far more scientifically and effectively, efficaciously demarcated between populations which were safe and populations which could be subjected to a certain kind of you know, danger, which uh, is a danger that comes from the pollution of atmospheres. That population could be criminal, could be insane, could be poor. So in a sense, on the German side, what we see is a clear method of criminal genocidal warfare. On the American side, what we see is a kind of early biopolitical strategy. Both taken together form a kind of modern totality, which is a totality of what I will call scenario thinking. So this is not merely a question of producing a certain kind of warfare, which is, is more effective uh, than the uh, old method of warfare. It is also a kind of thinking which is divided on both sides. On one side, this thinking becomes securitarian and the Americans excel at it. On the other side, it becomes a, 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 a thinking that is genocidal and the Nazis are the paradigm for it. But they cannot quite be completely made distinct insofar as they both belong to scenario thinking. And what it does is something very damaging. What it does is while there's a clear and very marked out distinction between what in the earlier times would be a distinction of ideas in terms of theology, say the Christian idea of holy war, and as opposed to the Islamic idea of holy war, where the two religious systems are clearly marked out and they would enter into a kind of crusades. And whoever wins, just doesn't merely win the war, it he, that side also wins the war of religious ideas for a time. In the case of the, of the present uh, 20th century or the beginnings of 20th century, with the nature of this kind of uh, 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 
research, which leads both to the opening up of the atmosphere and the management of atmosphere into zones and into design zones. What we get is a relative corrosion or devaluation of the side of ideas. Such that by and large, on both sides, what we are interested in is really methods of execution, whether they be criminal execution or in the American case, relatively human from their side, humanitarian execution. But still, the main, uh, the main stakes now is not so much the victory of ideas or the loss of ideas, but the modal effectiveness of which scenario to adopt. In Germany, for instance, uh, at the very time when uh, the Nazi gas thing was taking place, there was an intense uh, campaign to carry out uh, demothing, you know, uh, de-insectifying the environment. So the same gas, which is uh, Zyklon B, uh, which is a specific uh, uh, gas which was used, is used both in the gassing of, of Jewish victims as well as in the demorphing and the uh, and, 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 and the and the de-insectifying of environments of atmospheres. In the one case, it is to what we call today air conditioning. It is the beginnings of what we call air conditioning. On the other, it is murder. But both peculiarly are thinkable only as two scenarios. There is a kind of flatness which comes, which emerges on the horizon now. Not the depth of ideas that much, as the flatness of scenarios, which constitutes the fundamental modality of scenario thinking. There's much to uh, analyze and, and, and study in depth uh, in in this in this particular part of my narration, uh, but uh, let me now uh, go to the third uh, scene of my narration, uh, which is uh, immediately after the researches that are going on and everything that is going on to the Second World War. Now, what is interesting is that once the Second World War is won by the Allies the entire method of gassing, because it ultimately becomes totally associated with the monstrosity of genocidal, the genocidal war, war against Jews by the Nazis, all gassing methods are abandoned, including the American, you know, on the American side. So you don't have any research on this kind of gas chambers or making of gas chambers anymore. So in a way, the archive is, in a sense, put on hold. There's a kind of, it, it is, uh, it, it goes into a zone of silence, this archive. But exactly at this point, when you study the emergence of a new kind of uh, thinking in the US, in the US government, uh, we find that uh, a certain kind of uh, expertise is being produced. Now, this is the point I'd like to just remind you of, that one thing that happened with this, with this kind of gas research and this gas warfare uh, that started you know, roughly in early 20th century, 1915 or so, is also the production of a, a certain kind of new expertise and a new professionalism. So one of the German doctors who won the Nobel Prize, called Fritz Habit, who was a great um, scientist pioneering gas research between the two wars, said uh, very, very lucidly that during a war, he is a patriot. During peace, he is a humanitarian. This became a new principle of differentiating these two scenarios that during a war, I will produce or I'll put all my scientific int intelligence or resources into producing even deadlier methods of war. While in peace, my principle is universalistic and I'll work for the uh, betterment of mankind with the same resources, with the same, with the same knowledges. So in that sense, there seems to be with, uh, with, with such a enunciation, a, a kind of a, a simple a simple distribution between these two um, historical epochs, between 
peace and war. But in actuality, what we find is that these principles are continuously, if not only being complicated, they're actually being falsified by the fact that exactly when new methods of war are being created, which includes gas warfare here, exactly at this time, a new kind of research on how to prevent oneself being extremely victimized or, or being, being endangered by this very method of war as securitarian research is taking place, which spills over into peacetime. So then peacetime research is not humanitarian at all in the universalistic sense. Peacetime research becomes securitarian and defensive. And what peacetime, peacetime research does is mostly to envisage possible scenarios of war in the future. So that's why a peculiar new knowledge uh, of and a new expertise develops in post 20th century America, which is called futurology. And one noted futurologist with a German name, Helmut Kahn, speaks of scenarios as a method of thinking the unthinkable. This is his uh, formulation, that scenarios are the method, the strategies, devices, through which we can think the unthinkable, which means what? Which means exactly what we had already encountered in the pataphysical scenario of the Ypres battlefield when the chlorine was exploded for the first time. Something that you are not able to imagine till then, which is not the clean death and life of one side versus the other side, but a general going berserk of populations, which, is, which doesn't necessarily end in death, but which leads to a progressive weakening of the human body in a certain atmosphere, in an endangered, polluted atmosphere. This very reality becomes a kind of virtuality, a potentiality for futurology. And now futurology envisages scenes from even deadlier warring contexts. For instance, the context of a thermonuclear war now. So in a, during a thermonuclear war, what will be the possible scenarios? Now this interestingly includes not just thermonuclear wars, but also other kinds of uh, catastrophes, for instance, pandemics, uh, unexpected earthquakes, climate change. The only specifying feature we have to keep in mind is that in this research of futurology, nearly every time what you encounter is a hypothesis that all these catastrophes are actually being triggered by an enemy antagonist. So the name of China comes very early in a possible scenario, actually. Or if not China, some other possible enemy antagonist. You can't quite prove it, but you hypothesize it. To that extent, the old historical theater of war is continued, where you have a clear distinction between the protagonist and the antagonist, the two sides, the victor and the loser, the two enemies and so on and so forth, the heroic you know, theater of war. But in actuality, this war is not really conducted through the great imagination and narrative of the victor of ideas as well as the victor of wars and the loser of ideas and wars. This is conducted in terms of, like I said, modality of scenarios. Which scenario is most effective as part of a defensive security and strategies? So from a theater thinking or a doctrine of theater, we move to what I've called scenario thinking, in which I'm actually citing Helmut Kahn he speaks of scenario as a mode of thinking. But like I said, thinking the unthinkable, where he takes a whole range of phenomena as part of the same club, which otherwise in a theater of war, in the anthropocentric theater of war, would be considered different in, 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 in their specificities. So thermonuclear war, pandemics, earthquakes, climate change, all of them, terrorism. So eventually something like terrorism comes into the picture. Now, in the, in the anthropocentric theater of war, this kind of classification would make little sense because a climate change situation takes place through other factors than pure human voluntary, you know, or ideological action. Uh, a pandemic is uh, triggered by the spread of a new virus, 
And a thermonuclear war is something which sovereign nations might fight, fight with. Or they better not, but that's a kind of final horizon. But they're all clubbed together. Now, in a way, in Peter Sloterdijk's work, this logic is already announced. Because Peter Sloterdijk points out that actually what is happening with this very modality of gas warfare is that we are within fighting a war of sovereigns, the German and the American and so on and so forth, the allies and the, you know, the, 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 the German forces. The actual modality leads to a kind of um, thinking or a kind of conceptualization, which he calls terroristic. He actually gives it a name. He calls it atmo terroristic. He says terrorism is not a war of form where there is a clear terrorist form versus a form which is the normal form, the non-criminal form. Terrorism is a modality. So to that extent, he says, war and terror is a nonsensical phrase. Because there is no war on terror. The new form of war has a mode of being terroristic. Terrorism is a modality which, in a sense, emerges in the 20th century. Now, I think I, this is a complicated point, which I can't dwell over in this brief time. But I think Peter Sloterdijk's choice of the word terror remains a bit, um, for me, a bit unhappy. Because when you speak of terror in the modern age, uh, you already have a certain distribution of protagonists and antagonists, where certain parts of the population globally are already potentially identified to be potentially terrorists. But Sloterdijk from his side means it in very different. He says that kind of a fantasy of there being certain terrorists who we, you know, win by fighting a war on terror is a fantasy. Actually, the question of terror is structural. The moment war becomes modal, it does not attack bodies which are also attacking ideas, but becomes the general strategy of weakening atmospheres of we enter into something like a global civil war where all of the globe is now an atmosphere a complete reversal and opening up of the great vision of uh, Baudin, which was that all of nature all of the globe as an environment can be included in the consensual space of the theater which of course for Baudin was god was god's space but once God has, in a sense, escaped or dispersed in the air, literally in the air, as gas, what we get is environment in its indeterminacy, its danger, but also in its demands that we think with other principles than the earlier ones. But we are unable to do so. Hence, we produce the nonsensical proposition that something like terror as a modality can be retranslated back into the transcendental principle that there are some terrorists and there are some good people. This is what Slotterdijk very importantly uh, points out. In any case, the last five minutes or so, what I have to say, uh, it is during the post Second World, uh, Second World War period that we find this kind of a confusion between transcendental principles and modal thinking, which is scenario thinking, getting openly mixed up with official clubbing of wars, which are fought between sovereign entities, uh, like I said, pandemics, terrorist attacks, and other kinds of catastrophes, all being clubbed as possible scenarios. Now, it is exactly in this conjuncture that we must quickly remind ourselves that in the theater or in the literature of theater, one extraordinary text is produced by a theater thinker or a theater visionary uh, who was also a kind of, a kind of the madman of European theater, Antonin Arto, who produces a theater on the plague called Theater on the Plague in the 1930s, more or less in the same conjuncture. And he says that actually the plague is an opportunity to now escape the laws of the world and move into a completely new terrain of reversals, 
and inversions and transgressions. In this extraordinary text, scenarios of the plague are presented by Ortho affirmatively, not as scenes of danger, but scenes of a new opportunity when he says it is during a plague that the given laws of the world, for instance, the laws of family, where the obedient son can now kill the father, laws of nationalism or patriotism, where the soldier who had risked his life to save his country can now set fire to the city. He had risked his life to save earlier. Scenarios of reversal of values can be now pictured, which for him, he says, is the true emergence of what he calls the momentary uselessness of our actions, which he calls theater. So he thinks theater is actually neither a, a, a text of protagonists and antagonists, which leads to a kind of legitimate conclusion of one side winning and one side losing, one set of ideas winning, the other side uh, getting delegitimized. Nor is it something which is defensive and preventive. Theater is something which is a new, uh, a, a new assault in the real. And in a way, a pandemic situation, a plague, is a kind of opportunity to enter the real with a completely new subjectivity, new set of affects, with new gestures. In that sense, something going beyond the same anthropocentrism that we find in the earlier historical theater. But what is interesting, and one has to look at it with some skepticism, is that this kind of a picturization of scenarios of plague which Arto in a way praises and says this is an opportunity to let go of the laws of the world during a plague, exactly become the terms of securitarian thinking. When Helmut Kahn announces that it is to think the unthinkable for which we need scenarios, or when Peter Slaughterdick points out that it's actually when the gas for the first time hits the, you know, the, 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 the atmosphere and the bodies of soldiers that we find a pataphysical scenario, which actually is exactly the kind of picture that Arthur draws out. Then people are falling victims to the pandemic, to the new virus, but in itself, this also becomes a moment of transgression where extraordinary and fabulous crimes are being committed in Arthur's vision of theater, a new theatricality as it were, where the real and the theatrical cannot co quite be separated. This is appropriated, this virtuality, which Dallas and Guattari will call the exteriority of war, not anymore as a question of victory and loss, but as a pure, a pure uh, affair of speeds and slownesses, of affects, of a kind of war that is fought with no stakes. This very thing will be adopted, a kind of imminent war, rather than war which has transcendental principles supporting it. This very thing becomes part of scenario thinking in the 20th century, in the middle of, from the middle of 20th century, particularly exacerbated by the development of the media, where the media is already envisaging new possible scenarios on all sides, even though at a certain level, we try to distinguish between, for instance, democratic sovereign entities and authoritarian sovereign entities. The good democratic, you know, battler of a war and the bad authoritarian uh, ruler who is fighting a war. We'd make these distinctions, but in actuality, what floods us are images of scenarios or scenarios which are only envisaged, visualized as if they're all relative to each other. And all of them have to be prepared for as a defensive strategy. So in a way, the media internalizes as much as governments do this kind of scenario modal thinking while formally retaining a certain amount of adherence to transcendental thinking about the good and the evil. But that good and the evil have lost any kind of ground in earlier theological thinking in Jean Baudin. It had a ground which was Christian theology. Even in you know, religious holy wars, at least there was a ground between Islamic and the Christian, the Protestants and the Catholics. Whichever side you were on, there was a ground on which you stood. 
But the example of the current Russia-Ukraine war is an excellent example where we see, I mean, it's not an excellent example, it's a distressing example. It's a terrible example, but it's a, it's a, it's a vivid example of this kind of increasing relativization, particularly through its mediatization, where all of war is envisaged as something which has to be fought on the one side and managed at the same time through the control of its possible scenarios. So on the one hand, the Ukraine, uh, the Ukraine, um, Russian war returns us to the old historical theater of war, where one side is imagined as an authoritarian side, the other side is imagined as a relatively whatever democratic side. But actually, if you take a look at the distribution of uh, these roles or these positions, particularly through the media, then what you find increasingly is, like I said, all of them being reduced to possible scenarios and their managements, which in a sense is rationally explained not by actions of each of any of these sides, but rationally explained by something else, which is the continuation. This is what uh, the philosopher Michael Marder points out in his work, which is from the sphere of war into the sphere of the, what he calls capitalism, where capitalism works not by, by simple targeting of bodies, but it works by weakening of atmospheres. If capitalism finds that a particular zone is in a sense posing a kind of, you know, a marketable possibility, then that marketable possibility would have to be strengthened in terms of not so much individual customers as the zone, as the environment. Poverty is understood more and more, not so much as the poverty of individuals, but rather as the poverty of an atmosphere, which as far as possible must be redesigned according to the needs of capitalism. Often it is claimed, for instance, this happened both uh, during uh, the migrants who stood outside the, you know, uh, outside Poland, outside Warsaw, who were coming from different parts of the Middle East, including Afghanistan, after the Americans left Afghanistan. Uh, and, and, and one side said that actually the migrants are a strategy of war being launched by the Belarus and the other, uh, you know, Russian sort of satellite countries to, against Western Europe. Even if that is true, we do not know. The fact that there is migration which leads to enormous distress, if interpreted as war, leads to the question, what kind of a war is this? Clearly, it is not the war of life or death. It is the war of atmosphere, weakening of atmospheres and strengthening of atmospheres according to the logic of scenarios. And that's why uh, the entire lot of migrants in extreme cold were not allowed to enter Warsaw because it was seen as something which was part of the war of the illegitimate Belarus-Russian nexus against Western Europe, which could be true. I'm not saying it is true or not. I have no way of knowing. But I'm saying as a phenomenon, no one will claim the migrants were not real people. They were real people, but they were interpreted and seen and understood not as people, but as scenarios. This produces the logic of scenarios in the largest sense, not anymore through the logic of sovereign discrete entities with discrete authorities, precedents or, you know, dictators, doesn't matter. But as, as environments, as kind of displaced atmospheres, which can be strengthened or weakened rather than simply won or lost, which need to be calculated and capitalized, rather than being simply captured or freed. This leads to a peculiarly distressing uh, relativized um, logic of what I'll call capitalist civil war, which makes us uh, partly helpless in terms of truly authentically judging uh, the rightness and wrongness of wars on, uh, you know, on the side of different principles, because what has been partly abducted from us, stolen from us, is the truth of transcendental principles.
So one of the great weaknesses of scenario thinking or the limits of scenario thinking is that it produces a critique of war endlessly, but the critique of war endlessly is from the point of view of some war. There is always some war. This analysis had a certain attraction in philosophers like Foucault and others in the 60s and 70s, when even society was seen as a space of relations of power and so on and so forth. But in the present time, this mode of analysis, it seems to me, has reached a certain limit without taking away from the philosophical originality of these great authors. And that is why at the end, in my conclusion, I would like to urge for a new thinking of uh, new thinking, which is neither the old uh, sovereignist historical thinking, nor of course, Baudin's ideal theological thinking of sovereignty as a theater, nor can it be the, the kind, of, um, kind of crazy, crazy scenario thinking of securitarian um, worlds. But we need to think in a new way about how to exit war, not just from a point of view of war, but to thinking of a principle which is the principle of a subject with a greater amplitude and more profound ground than any war. This will sound idealistic till one tries this out. And yet, one can only take examples of how this has already been tried out or at least imagined in certain texts. So at the end, let me very quickly take an example from a somewhat disparate uh, ground or a set of references. Uh, the Indian thinker um, uh, B. R. Ambedkar wrote a final book called Buddha and His Dhamma. And uh, as you know, Buddhism, in a way, is a is the most famous um, system of thought, which is anti-war, which is for peace, and so on and so forth. But the real uh, question of uh, the actual story of Buddha has always been: Why did Buddha actually become Buddha? Why did he leave his house? Why did he actually? Uh, enter a new life. And often this has been um, seen as actually dramatized in a kind of scenario, where Buddha actually in a scenario of death felt something absolutely, uh, uh, you know, disconsolate and, and, and he couldn't reconcile himself to that scenario. And in another scenario at night when everyone was sleeping, he left the house and became what is called a parivraja. Now, interestingly, Ambedkar's text, Buddha and his Dhamma, departs from this kind of scenario thinking. And in Ambedkar's text, Buddha's departure is actually a reflect, reflective decision rather than the theatrical scenario of an action or a gesture or walking away because of an affect. Rather, what the reason, according to Ambedkar, Buddha leaves is that he considers the situation of history, which is a situation of war among his people and the neighboring people. Now, in a, in a recent uh, publication, not a recent, but, a, but one of the yeah, later publications, which is a supplement to the Buddha and his Dhamma, the editor of Ambedkar's work, Vasant Mool, refers to a play written before Ambedkar's text came out, long before actually, by the great scholar Dharmanand Kosambi, which is a play called Bodhisattva, which Vasudman says has striking resemblance to Ambedkar's way of depicting the departure, the uh, Buddha's uh, departure. And in the text Bodhisattva, what we get is an argumentative dramatic theater, where on the banks of the river Rohini, what we are really seeing is an argument over the possible thinking of a new principle that Buddha or Siddharth is thinking intensely over, which will enable him to, to exit the war, not escape it, but to exit it. A principle greater than the principles which govern war, which we have already seen, the war of ideas, the war of sovereignty, or Eventually, the war of security, the war to prevent war. You know, all critique of war is from the point of view of some war. And some war is always 
moderated by the thought of how to prevent that very war. And it's a vicious cycle which keeps weakening the world, the global atmosphere, or the world as an atmosphere, but never is able to escape it, not escape it, exit it in principle. And Buddha's search is for a principle of how to exit this very situation on the river where the two sides, the Sakya and the Kolyas are confronting each other. And Dharma and Kosambi is, is a play, is a theater, but it's a theater which is neither heroic, nor is it something which is only a kind of, uh, neither a secretarian nor a arto, arto inspired uh, um, proliferation of scenarios. It is a theater, if I may call it that, a theater of thought as vitalized and embodied in a kind of thinking humanity, which Siddharth represents not as a prince, but as any human being. In the sense that Marx himself called the space of, or the potentiality of a generic human or a generic human uh, humanity as a subject who can only work not by interest and stakes, but by universal principles. But the universal principle is not there for you to be handed down by experts, you know, because all our discourses of war are dominated by experts and diplomats. All television studios are monopolized by experts. Here we meet Buddha as Siddharth, not as an expert at all, but as a generic potential who at the very end of the play, till the very end of the play, and Ambedkar takes that up, wants to think the principle of how to exit the war in the name of, or on the grounds of something which is truer, as in any principle, the real stakes is not interest, not security, not management, but truth. It is for that truth that we really need to think of a theater uh, which is neither a sovereignist theater nor part of the theater of scenarios, but if I may call it that, a theater which is the very space of a kind of vital living thinking. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Omuda, for that absolutely fascinating theorization for taking us through so many things that you've taken us through. I don't think I can even respond by summarizing it, but this is an absolute fantastic theorization. And we're so lucky uh, that we're getting to hear you speak. You're going to obviously be speaking about this next month, and we hope to be able to read it in print when it does get published. But thank you so much, Shubhuda. But I'm not going to stand between you uh, and the questions because I've been receiving a number of questions for you. So I'm going to now ask my, uh, my dear colleague, uh, Sango, to take over and pose the questions which have been posted for you. Well, thank you have you so to read them about. out. Simeon, as you know, I won't be able to read. Yes, I know. I know. So yeah, yes, 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 of course. Sango will be reading them out. Uh, <clears throat> good evening. Can you hear me, sir? Yes, 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 I can. Okay. Uh, so, sir, thank you, first of all, for a really invigorating talk. I was really impressed with the kind of theorization you proposed for the scenario of wars that are taking place in the current world. So, uh, the first question that I would like to pose to you is by Professor Anuradha Ghosh. Um, and her question is, Though you center, uh, though you center on the notion of war as a point of departure to comment on theaters as scenarios, what about theater scenarios that emerge as part of dialogic encounters? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, well, I, I I'm not uh, entirely sure I uh, know what is meant by dialogic encounters here. Uh, uh, well, it could mean that um, a kind of uh, uh, theater the the space that is uh, that emerges out of uh, what could be called con um, uh, constructive, meaningful conversations between uh, between different kinds of uh, uh, different kinds of participants in a situation which is one of crisis or conflict, and how instead of entering into war. You enter into into a kind of conversation, 
Now, this is exactly what I tried to point out at the, at, at, by the last instance that I took, that uh, if you imagine Siddharth carrying out a conversation with others and including himself, of course, among people, among you know real people uh, who don't have any privilege as experts on how to think beyond the war and not think from the point of view which is somehow uh, encompassed or captured by some war, like I said, some mode of war here or there. Uh, if you do that, then in a way you're doing what this question, uh, Anuradha, is suggesting. You're carrying out a kind of dialogue. But the, the main point of the dialogue is not, not merely managerial. The dialogue is something which is centered on uh, a search for uh, a transcendence, or not really a transcendence, but a universality which comes from a situation, and yet which is make which which is able to which enables us to not be slaves to a situation and think only in relativist ways about one situation or one scenario vis-a-vis -vis another because it completely flattens the the, the landscape. Uh, so that is one side. The other side about dialogue, one has to be you know careful about this. In a in a in a standard sense, all dialogue is carried out between again a protagonist and I mean, two 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 entities. So in a sense, there is a kind of fixity or identity of entities. Sovereign entities have, for instance, the form of nations. You know, Ukraine, Russia. But look at the Ukraine, Russia situation. On the one hand, the war itself is so distressing and there are so many ways to look at it. Uh, and it's a complicated thing to talk about it. We don't have the time for that. But there is a kind of desire on part of the, uh, the Russian side, which wants to make this war also a larger question of uh, blocks on the world stage as uh, hegemony and hegemonic versus counter hegemonic blocks. So you will see one of the emerging blocks with the name which is very well known to us, the name Global South as a block which apparently is the antagonist of the, the American NATO bloc. But we have to ask the question very seriously, is the global South really, I mean, empirically you can use many kinds of combinations of countries, but is it really a co cogent, meaningful thought? Is global South thinkable in any meaningful way, in a true way? As a counter hegemon, in the current uh, scenarios, in the current you know, crisis, and within the structure, which is a relatively invisible structure of capitalism. In this context, maybe it is thinkable in very meaningful ways in cultural contexts, in post-colonial contexts, but in the contemporary context of war, wouldn't Global South and the Global North its themselves through the kind of operations of scenario thinking that are going on get relativized and cancel each other out? despite the desire of the Russian propaganda to project as if this war is actually on behalf of a emerging global South, which is, uh, you know, winning the fight of hegemony of the earlier hegemony that US and the US bloc exercised. So while the US bloc's hegemony is eminently criticizable, how far is the sort of theatrical imagination or imaginative scenario of this apparently counter protagonist global south true true that's why i i i urge us to think of a certain uh, of a certain um, uh, of a certain i don't know philosophy which is really a philosophy of truth yeah uh, thank you so much uh, the next question is by Shraddha from Jamia, and she asks uh, that she first of all thanks you for your valuable and wonderful thoughts. Uh, she says, if I say that the theater of war is now in the digital domains, the human, mechanic, and AI assemblages, perhaps the spectacle being the war of words itself or the taking over of someone's digital persona or data, what you, what would be your thoughts on this? Oh, this is fascinating. I'm, I'm no good at really uh, discussing this because I, I know very little about these things. But I think, I think this is a fascinating direction in which to uh, study uh, the theater of the world. 
So yes, the theater of the world is also a flat screen on the computer where uh, so many combinations, but the principal point remains uh, valid that this, uh, the, the, the flat screen empirically seems to exhaust all virtualities, while the very meaning of philosophical meaning of virtuality is that it cannot be exhausted. Yeah, uh, so the computer or the flat screen or digital uh, kind of digital thinking is a thinking which is also contradictory. It in a sense gives us a sense of control over possible scenarios. And yet it also gives us a sense of uh, almost a vertigo uh, intoxication with the possible infinity of scenarios. So both things it uh, seems to give us uh, you know, access to, but uh, it is actually a kind of uh, maybe a fallacy, uh, partly a kind of empiricist fallacy that what we are able to literally create digitally uh, out of nothing possible scenarios is something which is thinkable in terms of truth uh, and the truth as, as, as something which is which is with the domain of philosophical thought and empirical possibility they come together in a in a one-on-one -on -one correspondence this seems to be an empiricist fallacy which the digital world really you know encourages us to uh, fall victim but this is a fascinating area of uh, thought where the digital world and its assemblages uh, are the real material of the theater of the world. Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, so the next question is by Sophia. And she asks, Dr. Chaudhary, how, uh, how do we explain the bombing of Hiroshima? Was it mere guessing? Or was it systematic killing by the Americans? Or was it genocide? Because we hardly hear of the Hiroshima bombing as referred to as a genocide. Thank you. Right. Correct. Correct. Absolutely. Absolutely true. Uh, so, so uh, mm, uh, when we speak of genocide, so let me answer it uh, in a in a in a in a logicist way. When we speak of genocide, we uh, usually evaluate an action to be a genocide, or in the in the in the nature of a genocide, if not a total genocide, or not a genocide, where these actions are usually murderous. This is what uh, happens with uh, Hiroshima, that mostly Hiroshima, while being, um, being, being you know, spoken of as an act of extreme horror, uh, nevertheless, you're right, is not spoken of as a, as a genocidal act, because apparently uh, the bodies of a particular population are not targeted by that bombing or the atmosphere of that particular, uh, you know, the envelope of that particular community is not targeted as, uh, as an object of progressive degeneration uh, or degenerating, uh, which in effect it does. So you're totally right when Hiroshima is bombed for generations up to the present, the environment degenerates. It is not so, I mean, it is very different in scale, but in, in specific qualitative terms, it is not different from the union carbide, uh, the gas leak that took place in Bhopal. There is an endless degeneration of the atmosphere. Not simply killing, but weakening as if endlessly, infinitely, indefinitely, the, 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 the bodies which that envelope envelopes. Saturates. And yet it is never seen to be genocide. It is seen to be an accident or at the most crime, you know, but actually it is a kind of genocide which capitalism uh, in a different way perpetrates, which doesn't maybe target uh, populations in terms of specific identities, but does target population in terms of potentiality of capitalization. So of course Hiroshima is different because there it was a clear targeting of a city and a population. But what is what Slotetic's work really shows is that there is a deep and distressing irony about this. And where the Americans at that point at least won this fight of some kind of he hegemonic justification of their actions by saying that all of this we are doing eventually for securitarian reasons and not for geno genocidal reasons. And there is a clear discrepancy and hypocrisy in this justification, on the, in this uh, mode of reasoning. But you see, structurally, logically, at that time, we still are 
still, though in a kind of last phase of doing so, we still measure an action by some transcendental principles. Whether the Nazi ideology as a transcendental principle of genocide applies to the American bombing is something we can at least discuss and have different views on. But at least there is some solidity, some reliability of the transcendental principle, which comes from a kind of inherited idea of sovereignty and the stability of a space of possible consensus. Possible, not real. This dissipates more and more in the last 70 years, post Second World War, in the period of a kind of normalization of scenario thinking. That was what I was trying to emphasize. Yes. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, the next question is, uh, how do we think about the dynamics of language, spectacle, and sovereignty in the theater of war? Uh, well, again, this is a very large question. Uh, let me uh, go back to Shakespeare. Uh, in Shakespeare's theater, uh, uh, language is a, a real uh, moment of um, moment of a kind of connect. It's the connecting tissue between the central protagonist, let's say Richard III, and the environment, which is a kind of historical environment. But on stage, that historical environment is uh, progressively entering into crisis, degenerating, dissipating. And uh, one of the elements of that uh, of that uh, environment, that historical environment being shown on stage, is also other life forms than the human life form. So in Richard III, uh, the other life form in question is the horse. So when Richard III is fighting his last battle, he eventually is dispossessed of his horse. And then he makes this uh, utterance. You know, this, this, this line from Shakespeare, a horse, a horse, my kingdom for a horse. Now, this is paradoxical. He's willing to give up the very thing he spent his life over, which is the stakes of sovereign power, for that very thing which he needs to win the battle. So battle has become absolutely dynamic and relative to the transcendental stability of that, of that value, which is sovereignty he was fighting for. So Shakespeare is probably the most uh, the most uh, brilliant example splendid example of this kind of historical intelligence that is the connecting tissue and through language through language the shakespeare is nothing if not language or the connecting tissue between the abstract form of the transcendental sovereignty theater of sovereignty and the real scenarios of war there is another, uh, there's another theatrical form which we can think of, which is uh, the opposite of Shakespeare in a sense, though Shakespeare employs that form, which is what in, what in Commedia dell'arte is called the buffo form, the buffoon form. The buffo is the form which in a sense is, the, uh, is, that, is on the edge of form, that it is no form. It's like a plain and simple you know, act uh, in the theater of doing uh, something which is uh, purely, uh, purely not just comic, uh, but uh, something ridiculous, the act of buffoons. But interestingly, in particular situations of war, certain warring, uh, warring figures are treated as buffoons rather than sovereigns, even if they are sovereigns in their, from, from where they come from. So Chinggis Khan, you know, uh, 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 Delos in his Delos and Gothar in the chapter uh, War Machine in a Thousand Plateaus point out that that Genghis Khan, as a kind of uh, as a kind of force of migration and conquest, coming into a new land, which is conquering, is treated not as a, 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 as a as a as an enemy or as a as a friend, but is treated as someone who they do not understand. So in that sense, as a technically a buffoon, a buffo. So buffo has no speech. Buffo is the kind of brute presence. So sometimes, sometimes, wars are also seen not as meaningful wars, but as the sudden sort of, you know, entry onto the stage of war, the buffoon. Now the buffoon can also be the migrant. The migrant who speaks a language we do not understand. In capitalism, often migrants are seen both as possible, you know, workers who can make value, but also 
buffoons who are useless, who, are, who have no discourse, no speech. So again, I think it's very important to think of the role of speech, both in terms of actual theatrical speech, but also in, uh, in the metaphor of theater as something which contributes to the discourse of war, not just as a space of victory and loss, but as a, uh, as a space of a kind of contest over ideologies and ideas. Uh, which, just, just to add, which in the present times exacerbated by the media is really, really, uh, it, it, it is very low on its premium. It, has, it is deep, greatly devalued. The, ide the ideological or the philosophical side. Right. <clears throat> yeah, uh, the next question is by... Uh, if we are not running out of time, uh, I would like to pose a couple of more questions. Is that fine? I'm okay. I mean, it's up to you guys. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you so much, sir, for being generous with your time. So the next question is by Faizan. And uh, he asks, uh, do you think scenario thinking is in some sense akin to thinking through topoi as articulated by Ernest Robert Curtius in European literature and the Latin Middle Ages. Well, I told you that uh, the theater of the world as or the encyclopedic thought of, say, Jean Baudin is really a thought of, uh, uh, well, it's not Topoi, he is a local, it's very close to Topoi, which is, uh, which, which are places and placeholders with particular, uh, with a particular position and a particular connection with other places and other placeholders in a hierarchical uh, universe. Uh, but the real point of this hierarchy is that this entire space together, all of it signifies something which is a kind of, uh, which is a kind, that's why the metaphor of theater is used, uh, which is a kind of controllable or, or manipulable, naturally designed space. Hence, I started out with a proposition that in the, in the encyclopedic theater, there is no atmosphere. The theater is bigger than the sky. This, there is no sky in the theater. Or the theater doesn't exist under a sky. The sky enters the theater in the 20th century. But at the same time, the theater opens up to the sky with gas warfare, which is a moment of extreme trauma, a kind of pataphysical madness where all scenarios go berserk but it is exactly at that moment that uh, there is a new thinking which Slaughterdick points out, which is uh, thinking of how to redesign this kind of indefiniteness into human objects or human humanized objects. A gas chamber for the American uh, research is a humanized object as a mode of execution. You know, so in that sense, these are all considerations on topoi or locuses, which are which are. Which, which are thinking about space or spatial localization, uh, not simply as, uh, as, as territories, but as encodings. But like Dallas and Guattari point out, all of these are always tentative and susceptible to deterritorialization, crisis, dissolution. So yes, that would be my response. Okay, uh, the next question is, um, as sinister as it may sound, the more we move towards the idea of planetarity, do you think the current ideas of designing the atmosphere can be modified or rethought? Well, uh, as far as I understand, planetarity is thought of both in terms of a certain kind of uh, a certain kind of inclusion of all possible bodies beyond the human body as part of a, um, a single system of thought, or at least a set of uh, a set of principles which respond to planetary considerations rather than anthropocentric considerations. Uh, that is uh, one level. To that extent, planetary thinking is uh, something which I, which is not incompatible with what Marx called, or even. The, uh, the, the example that I gave of Buddha and Ambedkar, uh, which is a kind of thinking of the possibility of uh, 
generic humanity or social humanity or universal humanity, it does not make uh, planetary thinking anthropocentric again. In a way, all global humanity is something uh, which, uh, or not global humanity, universal humanity, would in a sense can only exist outside. It can never be a sort of the inside, a controlled design atmosphere. Uh, so any effort to redesign the open would in a sense be anti-planetary if planetary means to think of a true principle of something open, something which is a totality forever being deterritalized as the old philosopher Jean-Paul Sartre would say, you know? But if planetary means something which is like a, uh, which is like a planetary program, for instance, weaponizing the planet, you know, uh, uh, setting up nuclear weapons and uh, even targeting planets beyond the earths, that kind of planetary programming is indeed nothing but extending the law of death from humans to non-humans, which is what we are mostly doing, no doubt, yes. It depends on how we think of the idea of what we call calling the planetary. So, uh, sir, there's one last question that sure. I would like to uh, pose to you. Sure. Um, so just give me a minute. So slightly, it's a long question. So just give me a minute. Sure. Um, thank you for this incredible uh, talk, Shomu sir. I was also thinking of another scenario or stage of scenario thinking in the form of sonic warfare. Where... Sorry, I, I, I lost uh, a few... Yeah, I, can I just repeat? I'll just yeah, please, repeat. Do, please do. Please. Yeah. I was also thinking of another scenario or stage of scenario thinking in the form of sonic warfare, mm -hmm. where a mode of psychological warfare yes. uh, gets. Sorry. Yeah. Where a mode of psychological warfare gets produced in the form of sound that. Uh, physiologically affects the body, yes. but also psychoacoustic tactics uh, during the Vietnam War and many more examples. Yes. What struck me is that in both gas-based and sonic warfare, there are bound to be atmospheric leaks, but there is a different kind of depth involved in the latter. Do you think this sonic modality would shift or counter the thinking around the concept of atmospheres in scenario thinking in any way. No, that's a that's a wonderful uh, uh, point that 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 has been made. Uh, sonic warfare is something which, in a sense, uh, is a, a further intensification and development of gas warfare and atmosphere or atmo terrorism, as uh, Slotterdijk uh, prefers to call it. I do not quite subscribe to that terminology, but still. A kind of atmo terror. Uh, so sonic warfare, warfare is also something which enters into uh, 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 modes of, you know, uh, intra-war uh, procedures. For instance, the procedure of torture. So during the Vietnam War, but also carrying on to the present, something like clean torture is, uh, is a project of states, uh, where torture can be normalized as something which takes place peculiarly without any phenomenological upsurge, a kind of de-phenomenalization of torture and yet re-making uh, re, uh, making torture that much more effective, you know, re-effectuation of torture while de-phenomenalizing it. So of course, sonic warfare involves the phenomenon of sound, no doubt, but it is also in a way to at least partially invisibilize torture or warfare by taking away at least its vi its visual uh, theatrical exterior or appearance, you know? In that sense, uh, gas is also clearly a metaphor or an image of making the phenomenon of war, which contributes, contributes to its theatricalization because of its uh, sensuous force in, as gesture, as speech and so on uh, into something which is a kind of, uh, if not a de-phenomenalization, uh, a kind of 
uh, uh, oblique phenomenalization. So sonic warfare is an example of a kind of oblique phenomenalization, which gives the appearance of clean torture, clean warfare. You know, but in, in effective, in, in actuality, these are nothing but strategies of making war even more effective uh, so as to both secure a, a certain kind of, uh, a certain kind of uh, not really, not really win or loss in war, but how to make the war sustainable. You see, one of the great perversities of our situation is this. Exactly when we speak of the sustainability of the planet, what we are, we seem to be really concerned with is the sustainability of war. How can the two go together? And yet, this is what we are living with. Sonic warfare, in a way, is distressingly and perversely a more sustainable war. Atmo war is more sustainable war. Exactly when Atmo war is what is making our lives as part of the planetary you know, atmosphere unsustainable. That is, the, that is the real knot that I'm trying to, in a sense, disentangle here. Thank you so much, sir, for answering all those questions. Uh, and now I would uh, hand over the virtual mic to Aparna Pathak to deliver the vote of thanks. Good evening, everyone. It has been an intellectual treat to listen to Dr. Shamubrata Chaudhary speak. And on behalf of the Department of English and the organizing team, I would like to thank everyone who made today's event successful. First and foremost, a huge thank you to our speaker, Dr. Shamubrata Chaudhary, who has given us so much to reflect on. His talk was truly enriching and as a, as a think piece will be discussed beyond this evening and will certainly help us all think through these issues. Thank you, Dr. Shami Brother Chaudhary for lending us so much of your time and for sharing your insights with us. We are indeed grateful to you. As always, I would also like to thank our HOD Professor Simi Malhotra a thank you to Suman, Sango, Zera, and everyone on the organizing team who are responsible for running our event so smoothly. And thank you to our audience, everyone who tuned in today from all sorts of time zones and places. Thank you so much, friends, and we hope to see you all again very soon. Thank you. Thank, thank, you. thank, thank you. Thank you so much, Omoda. So, so thank grateful. You. This was absolutely fantastic. So grateful, my, Shomoda. My thank you. Thank my you. Pleasure. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank I'll you. see you soon, hopefully, Sumi. Yes, yes, Shomoda. We must meet. We must yes, meet. Yes. We'll plan and meet. We'll, we'll meet on campus. Yeah. Yes, we must do that. Yes. Yeah. Thank, so, you. thank yeah. you. Thank you. Shumada. Thank you, Shomoda. Thank you. And thank you to your students also. We're so grateful. Yes, I, 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 I never stop thanking them. I know, I know, I know. Thank yeah. you. Thank you, Shomoda. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Uh, can you switch off the connection because uh, you know they, uh, the, my student just gone out. Yeah, uh, yeah, 